Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today, we have Lila Draft Johnson, a gender-based violence researcher. Today, we're going to discuss gender-based violence in sport, sports league policy, and education. Let's get to it. Welcome, Lila. Thank you for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. Thanks so much for having me, Angela. I'm really glad to learn about your topic of of, uh, research and learn a little bit more about gender-based violence in sports. So let's start off with some definitions. What is gender-based violence? And is this the same? Is it different than domestic violence? Give us a little context here of what we're going to be talking about today. Definitely. Um, There's a lot of different words that folks choose to use when they're talking about different gendered forms of violence. Um, I personally use gender-based violence um, because I think it is a nice umbrella term that refers to a wide range of different forms of violence that occur um, on the basis of of gender. Um, I use the term specifically to talk about mostly domestic violence, sexual violence, and sexual harassment as it occurs in sports. Um, but it's really it's really a term that was coined to sort of focus more of the attention on the structural causes of violence and that connection between gender, power, and violence. Um, so it, it can refer to um, a wide range of things, but for today's conversation, uh, we're sort of using it as a catch-all for domestic and sexual violence. And there is has been some notorious cases that have arisen in, in sports which is why we're we're talking about this issue and the connection to the two sports today. Um, I, one of the most famous examples that our audience may be familiar with is the Ray Rice example. Can you tell us a little bit about the Ray Rice situation and, and what sort of prompted sports organizations to look a little more closely at gender-based violence amongst their athletes? Yeah, so in um, in 2014, some folks might remember that uh, there was a viral video of Baltimore Ravens running back Ray Rice striking his then fiance Janae Palmer in an Atlantic City casino elevator. Um, and what I always say is that uh, Ray Rice wasn't the first professional athlete to commit an act of violence against his partner, but he was the first who really went viral for it. So this video circulated widely, um, and the NFL responded with a two-game suspension, I believe a $50,000 fine, and that ended up eliciting uh, really immense public outcry. Uh, people wanted to see the NFL come down harder um, for what for what they had seen. Um, TMZ actually ended up releasing a sort of even more um, violent video um, with, with more information of the incident uh, in September of 2014, and that led uh, uh, a congressional committee to call the four major men's sports leagues in in the United States, so the NFL, uh, NBA, uh, NHL, and MLB, to a hearing in December of 2014 uh, to talk about what were they doing to address domestic violence in professional sports. And it was after all of that congressional scrutiny, um, so sort of in 2015 and beyond, that we've seen these different professional sports leagues formulate gender-based violence policies. Um, Again, I'm using gender-based violence. These policies uh, typically relate to domestic sexual violence uh, and child abuse as well. Um, And um, that's just a little bit of a, a primer to get us started. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So where the Ray Rice incident was sort of a catalyst um, calling sports professional sports teams to the carpet <laughs> um, uh, to have them be a little more um, diligent about about their governance over their players. And so it's really interesting. You said there was a four kind of the four major professional sports leagues that were called to the carpet. And I know you have some experience with Major League Baseball. Tell us a little bit about your time working with Major League Baseball and your your role that you served working on this issue with gender-based violence? Sure, yeah. So um, as I mentioned, um, a number of these sports leagues ended up forming policies. One of those leagues was Major League Baseball. Um, They have uh, actually three covers players, um, Major League players, one covers Minor League players, and the last one covers uh, non-playing personnel. So 
anyone that's working on a team or in the league. Um, and the policy there basically has uh, four components. Um, there is education. So anyone across the league, whether you are a player, pitcher on the mound, or selling peanuts in the ballpark, um, you're required to go through at least a uh, one sort of educational awareness training on topics like domestic and sexual violence. Um, and it was that part of the policy that I was hired to help out with in uh, June of 2019. Uh, I spent two years in the league office. I left in 2021 to start graduate school. Um, and so I, I mostly worked on those educational workshops. So uh, designing the curriculum, facilitating it with uh, mostly minor league players and uh, league and team staff. Um, the major league policy is collectively bargained with the union. And so um, they would always bring in sort of outside specialists uh, because of sort of the conflict of interest there. Um, but uh, that's a little bit of um, an intro to sort of to my job there. Yeah, that's really interesting that Major League Baseball is doing a, a lot of education. So they have some policies in place and education as well. And these policies sound a little stronger than most businesses because they extend to their personal lives, right? What they do, maybe even outside of the of of the job. Um, so, as compared to other sports organizations, was Major League Baseball at least at the time were they a little more progressive um, in in their stance and their response to um, the the meeting in front of Congress? Yeah, you know, I. Um... I think when all of the all of the teams, you know, initially arrived at Congress, uh, all of them had their work cut out for them um, and, and really needed to improve in this area. Um, based on my understanding of MLB's policy and the other policies at the league, uh, the thing that I do think really makes MLB's policy unique is its emphasis on education um, and prevention. Um, their policy is also... Uh, one of the only ones that has a provision for um, supporting community organizations. Um, so that's written into their policy. And obviously all of these leagues, um, you know, have corporate social responsibility departments. They're donating to various organizations, but MLBs has it written in their policy, which sort of uh, makes it so that it, it has to happen. It, well, this, you know, in 2015, this, this sort of came to light and then the pressure was put on these major professional sports organizations to do something. But, you know, just recently, Charles Barkley um, has kind of called the N NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, to the carpet about um, plans to, to, to be more stringent in addressing domestic violence after some disturbing incidents have come to light with NBA players. So, what what do you what do you think what do you what do you see what do you what do you say in response to um, that sort of call to action that has been um, pitched to the NBA? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I actually I can picture that clip you're talking about right now. <laughs> and one of the things that was really interesting to me about Adam Silver's response is that he immediately credited the players' union. Um, the, the NBA's player, player union. Um, and something that I do think is notable about both MLB and the NBA's policy uh, and the WNBA as well is that policies are jointly bargained with their players' associations. And um, essentially what that means is that both, both the, the union and the league has a say in, in what that disciplinary process and investigations process is gonna look like. Um, and something that was interesting for me when I looked, uh, my, my current research right now looks at that congressional hearing back in 2014. Um, and something that was really interesting to me was this positioning of labor rights as oppositional to gender-based violence accountability efforts. And something that we've seen in the years since um, since these policies have been enacted is that uh, when you have situations where um, discipline is handed down un unilaterally from, um, for example, for, for example, um, the commis commissioner at the NFL, um, which is the way the NFL's policy works, um, it's mandated unilaterally. Um, in neutral arbitration, the discipline ends up changing a lot, which ends up being um, 
oftentimes really harmful for the survivors involved. You know, you think that um, you think that the perpetrator is going to receive X punishment. The punishment changes. It's confusing. It forces you in the spotlight for another time, as a lot of news outlets will pick it out. Um, and so even though I, I think a lot of folks are really critical of, um, and, and are concerned that player unions are going to, um, you know, be advocating for players who have, who have done, uh, done really harmful things. Um, something I found in my research is that, uh, when teams do jointly bargain their policies, the policies end up being more effective, more consistent, um, and there's sort of additional research that shows that when um, when when perpetrators feel that they're uh, being treated fairly in the process, they're they're more likely to comply with things like um, uh, court orders and um, blanking on the name. But when you're when you're in no contact orders, uh, things like that. So um, I think I've taken us a little bit far away from your initial question. But, <laughs> uh, that that was. Um, so if there's parts of it you want me to pick back up, I'm happy to. Well, but the question that's, um... was about the question was about the NBA and and Charles Barkley's call to the commissioner to do something to um, kind of stop domestic violence or at least hold hold players accountable for their actions. Um, but you were mentioning some challenges with with that process and things that can make it difficult. And I believe what you were saying is that if it's jointly negotiated between the players in the, in the team or the players in the league, um, then the players are more likely to follow the, follow the process and they're, it's more likely to be effective and, and consistent results. Is that correct? Is that what you were saying? So that's yeah, really exactly. interesting because you would almost think there'd be like some kind of conflict with them negotiating or them having, uh, helping, helping to establish policies of how they might be, punished in the event that this would happen to them. But that's that's not been the case in your research that you found in your research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Tell us more about your research and what you've what you've learned and what you've discovered along the along the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like I mentioned, I um, was largely analyzing the congressional hearing text um, from the uh, addressing domestic violence in professional sports in 2014. And what I was really interested in was uh, understanding how the senators involved, as well as the league executives and union representatives, understood the issue of gender-based violence in sport and um, how they were interested in trying to solve it. Um, and something that uh, one of one of the findings I really saw is that um, you know a lot of the times when we when we talk about, about we have these conversations around domestic and sexual violence, especially when it happens in the case of a celebrity or, you know, a popular player. Um, we really, we really do zero in on that individual, um, and I think that's important because we need to, um, you know, we do we need to hold people accountable. Um, but I also think about the way that by focusing so much on individuals, we really kind of obscure the 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 whole machine that really kind of produces um produces this kind of violence and allows it condones it um and so that was really present in the hearing was um these specific mentions of individual players who had committed violence uh, but not as many conversations about the actual structure of professional sports which itself is um you know, a system that is really rife with power imbalances, uh, which is, you know, a really key part to how um, how domestic and sexual violence happen. Um, it's a it's a space where you know a very specific kind of masculinity is sort of expected to be performed. Um, and even though you know we we often think of professional athletes as um, you know the folks that made it, the folks that are getting paid millions of dollars to play a sport. Um, I think it's really important to think about, um, you know, not just those players we see in the limelight, but sort of the cauldron of players that it takes to produce that one Steph Curry um, or, you know, wh whoever it is. Um, and a lot of those folks have to work their way up through um, a pretty difficult, you know, minor league or player development system. Um, they've spent their entire lives really zeroed in on 
um, on their sport and themselves are really subject to a lot of surveillance and control um, in, in their line of work. Uh, and and violence themselves um, sometimes on the field, and so um, so so largely sort of a lot of what I'm advocating for is I think about okay I've done this research what do I want to change about these policies um, is really for this focus to shift from individual perpetrators to thinking about okay what is the system like. And what are ways that we can, you know, tinker with the system to make it a little bit more of a humane space for people? Um, and and what impact will that have on, you know, the kinds of violence, um, or, or hopefully uh, it, it will stop violence that's happening, you know, off off the field. And, and let's dive in a little bit. And I know your research is focusing a lot on the the professional leagues, but grassroots level, like you mentioned, there's the violence probably isn't starting at the professional level, right? Like it's starting before that you mentioned, uh, even on the field, it becomes a culture and acceptance and, and their sort of training condition, or maybe the, in their hometowns growing up because they're an excellent athlete, maybe they're forgiven for, for behavior that would be inexcusable in other environments. So uh, what can you say, uh, tell us about the, the, grassroots programs that are kind of funneling these athletes into the professional setting? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, and I, I think it's, it's interesting to think about kind of the crisis that's happening right now with youth sports in the, the United States. Um, I know the Aspen Institute is uh, sort of the, those are the researchers I look to um, for information on this, but um, youth sport has, you know, Throughout, throughout the last couple of decades really started to change from being about play and uh, movement and team building to prepping kids to get ready to make the D1 roster, um, preparing them for their, their lives as Olympians or professional athletes. Um, and so I think, I think it is really important to think about, okay, what, what kind of culture is getting promoted at these youth leagues? Um, and, and what are the ways that we're teaching teaching athletes to uh, relate to their own bodies and relate to the, the bodies of the other players they're um, interacting with. Um, and also thinking about, you know, what is a coach modeling in the way that they choose to uh, discipline players, talk to players, um, things like that. So um, I feel like I'm sort of foreshadowing <laughs> uh, some, of, some possible answers to your question. Um, but uh, I think that that education and um, you know you, you really thinking about um, how how is what's happening in professional sports trickling down to that youth level, um, how that might be impacting this as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then of course the professional athletes are role models for the future players and the future generation. And so role models at the local level for their coaches as well as those professional athletes and. We've talked, we've kind of hinted a lot of, on male sports, but this does not an I gender based violence is not isolated to to men as as perpetrators. They can also be victims. They, they either can even be violence um, against same sex. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how broad this goes as far as um, across the across men's and women's leagues. Yes, I will say that. Um... Most of because most of my research is focused on men's sports, I'm uh, mostly able to speak to that. But um, I will say that the the WNBA does have a domestic and sexual violence policy. I believe it's more or less equivalent to what the NBA um, has, and um, and I think um, I guess I I kind of have this impulse to sort of like turn your question a little bit to to speak about. Um, just the the prevalence of gender based violence in society and the fact that so many people are are impacted by this um whether it's witnessing violence in their home growing up um or experiencing it themselves in some way um and obviously it is it is mostly women and gender nonconforming folks that are disproportionately suffering from it but i think there is you know a huge uh silent epidemic for men and boys as well um and um 
And so if, if you'll allow me, I think one of the ways that I'll sort of shift shift a little bit with this question is to talk about, um, I guess, one of the other sort of policy recommendations that I really have for these this kind of new idea of instituting gender-based violence policies uh, in corporations. Um, and that is to really, um, I think, kind of bring it back to the basics of um, basic workplace and labor conditions and uh, really start to think about those as protective factors for your employees. So 99% um, of domestic violence cases uh, involve financial abuse. So a player, control, uh, not a player, excuse me, <laughs> a person, um, a person controlling your uh, finances or uh, sabotaging your ability to get to work, credit scores, things like that. Um, and so um, there's a lot of things that workplaces can do to really uh, make it easier for survivors to leave unsafe situations. Um, and it's it's things like raising, uh, raising the minimum wage so that it's a livable wage. Um, and it's having flexibility on things like sick leave um, and um, you know policies that really provide people with the flexibility they need to um, to relocate um, and generally just have that economic self sufficiency to uh, to to leave un unsafe situations. Um, and so I think a lot of times we think about these policies as educational workshops or holding people accountable, discipline. Um, but I think we also need to think about what are ways that we can just ensure that folks have access to the, the kind of basic things that they need um, so that when, when something does occur, they're able to, um, to, to get out of it. You're sort of hinting a little bit about the, the power and control wheel, right? And then I know another one that's sort of... Um... I don't know if newer is the correct term, but it's maybe something that's less understood is the, the technology piece and technological control. Can you, in the light of the digital age, can you illuminate uh, us as to what that means in, in the span of, of this um, gender-based violence or domestic violence? Yeah, so um, yeah, technology and technological control has definitely gotten a lot more um, prevalent. Um, as we keep refining our technologies, um, and it also is unfortunately refining the capacity of, of people that use harm in relationships to uh, surveil their partners, um, you know, track their whereabouts and request things like, you know, photo evidence to prove where you are, um, things like that. Um, and I think also, um, there's definitely a lot of incidents, especially in the sports world, with um, you know inappropriate messages being sent through technology, and um, you know I think across the board, not even just in sports, uh, we're really trying to figure out how do we how do we legislate um, and and create policies that protect against things like that. But that's a little bit about uh, techn technological abuse, right? There. And even like taking away someone's phone, right? Access to access to that resource, or they're taking away their their computer or something like that. Um, going back into the the education piece in your time at, with Major League Baseball, um, you you mentioned there's there's a, a training that happens on a regular basis. Um, and we've also talked about you know not all not all people are going to be perpetrators of, of violence and but some of them are going to be impacted by it. They may be witnesses to it or they may be you know, in that kind of in a relationship or in a sphere of a, a sphere of influence where violence is uh, exhibited, and so as part of that that education and training, I uh, could you tell us a little bit about the the piece that maybe where um, someone might be a witness or might be um, uh, you know otherwise victimized or exposed to a victim? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um... There's a couple things that come to mind. I think the first one to touch on, you know, people that are impacted by violence. Um, when when I worked at MLB, we always made sure to uh, include in our presentations um, the resources that the league has available for players and partners and families. Um, there's a number of different hotlines, um, some counseling services, um, and um, and a, a piece of our 
presentation, sort of depending on you know the audience, was sometimes um, talking about you know how do you have a conversation to support survivors or someone that discloses to you, um, and as well as things like bystander intervention. Um, what are some uh, easy, safe ways to intervene when you see uh, inappropriate comments or even actions occurring. Um, but one thing I will highlight is that um, I'm not sure about other leagues, but at least per MLB's policy, uh, pretty much everyone is um, not not a mandated reporter, but essentially is required to report any known instances of domestic sexual violence or child abuse to the league if they do become aware of it. Um, and so uh, that way, you know, folks folks who are not reporting things like that. Um, you know, do become complicit. Um, but I think that does allow for the league to become aware of more things um, than they other, otherwise might not. So some kind of reporting reporting structure as well. Mm -hmm. And the educational piece, how did, how did players or other employees respond to the training? Yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always, um, it always kind of varies, uh, depending on the time of day we're doing these trainings and and what they've been up to before and after it. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, this is an issue that that everyone does uh, largely agree on and uh, believes, you know, we need to make the culture of sport better. Um, so I definitely, um, I didn't always receive the most um, active participation uh, from from athletes, um, but but they heard, <laughs> heard the message and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, through time, um, that message continues to sink in more and impact the sport. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final things you'd like to tell us about this topic and, and or your research? Yeah. Um, I think for right now, um, that's about it. Um, I am, uh, I, w I will uh, just put in a quick plug for, uh, I'm, I'm currently located at the University of Maryland and wrapping up a master's degree here. Um, in the physical cultural studies research group and um, looking forward to uh, trying to get my research out there um, and uh, to what's next. So thank yeah. you so much uh, for the opportunity and uh, really enjoyed talking with you today. Thank you, Lila. I appreciate your time and thank you for investigating this really important topic and doing some research and hopefully you'll continue to have an impact in the sports world. So thank you for your time there. Thank you to our Thank viewers you. today for joining us. Uh, that was Lila Drafts Johnson, who spoke on gender-based violence in sport, sports league policy, and education. So thank you for joining us today. Our next episode will be our guest, Jillian Franklin, who will discuss sports officiating. We'll see you then.